One of the best ways to grow as a developer and to learn a subject is to build your own version of something from scratch. In this video, we'll be building a language server from scratch to learn the language server protocol. We'll start off with an empty TypeScript file with no dependencies, and we'll end up with a working language server still with no dependencies. We're going to build the features like initialization, completion, and document synchronization. And we're going to be doing this all character by character, line by line. So fire up your text editor and come along with me on this journey. And at the end, we'll talk about how you can take your language server even further. We'll start by getting things set up in VS Code, but don't worry, this isn't VS Code only. You can happily follow along in whatever text editor you prefer. Just create an empty TypeScript project and then follow your editor's suggestions for connecting to its language server implementation. I'll have instructions for NeoVim in the description. Visual Studio Code is the most popular editor out today. It's just one place where you can run a language server, but if you're following along at home, it's probably the editor you're using. If you're trying to wire up a language server in VS Code for the first time, it can be a little confusing. To make this easier, I've published a minimum viable VS Code language server extension repo. You can clone down this repo and have everything you need to create an extension in VS Code. It consists of extension code that will launch and coordinate communication with a language server process. You can bundle this all up and publish it in the VS Code marketplace. Since this is a from scratch video, we'll be deleting all the server code and really just using this as the glue to connect our language server to Visual Studio Code. We'll start by cloning down the minimum viable language server extension and we'll save it as LSP from scratch. Now that we've cloned that, we'll cd into the directory and we'll do an npm install. These instructions are in the readme. And then once we're here, we'll do one more thing, which is we'll touch tmp example.txt. The reason that we want to do this is just so that we have a reliable file placed that we can use for testing our language server. And since it's a text file, uh, it's very unlikely that you have any other extensions that will be running on text files. So it's, it's going to be the most pristine experience that we can get. Having done that, we're ready to open VS Code. And once we're in here, we will go ahead and close the welcome menu. I'm also going to close the sidebar with command B. Uh, you can bring that back any point with command B or control B on Windows. If you hear command and you're in Windows, just press control and you should be good to go. Um, and what we're gonna do is do command P and open server.ts. So this is the existing content that is in uh, the minimum viable language server extension. And you see it imports a number of things from VS Code language server node. Quick plug, if you're developing a language server uh, for, for real use, not for scratch as a toy, this library is absolutely the way to go. It's first class, it's built by the people that maintain the spec itself. So it's just the way to go. You're gonna get great types, you're gonna get great uh, functions, all the code completion, yummy goodness that you want. So a uh, huge shout out to that. But we are going to be writing this from scratch, so we won't be using that. The reason this is all bundled in the MVP is that you probably won't want to use it there. And also we have one behavioral thing wired up here, which is when the document's content changes, we're going to send out an information message that says on did change content and then has the document URI. So we're, we're going to use this to prove that things are wired up before we clear everything out and truly start from scratch. So I'm gonna do Command Shift B here to start our build. And then I will do Command Shift D to open the debugger. So I'll click on the play symbol here. This launches another instance of VS Code and it is the extension development host. The extension development host runs any client code you have in your extension. And then in our case, it also will spawn the language server process as a little sidecar. And the MVP has these things wired up to talk to each other. So what we can do here is open our, uh, I did command O, tmp, example.txt, and we'll hit enter on that. And so now we see down in the bottom, we have on did change content for our example file. That's great. Now that we've proved that this all works, we are clear to close this and delete all of this code. Once again, I'm gonna close the sidebar. Uh, we'll do command P and open up package.json for the server. 
And just to make sure we're truly from scratch, we're going to delete our dependencies here. So we'll clear that out and save, close that, and then we'll hop back in our terminal real quick and just do an npm install. And now if we do a tree of server node modules, we're going to see that there's nothing in there. So we're truly starting from scratch. Let's just go ahead and we'll edit our uh, git config to remove the origin. I don't want to accidentally push over this. Uh, then we can actually commit our changes. Scratch. All right, cool. So I'll have this repo uh, pushed and available down in the description. All right, so we're ready to start from scratch and we truly have nothing here. If we launch this, uh, we're gonna get an error. So let's just, let's just do that to see what it says. Um, whoops, that was the wrong one. We'll press play here. And we saw some messages show up there and then immediately disappear. We look at the output of the server here, we see the initialization failed. So the client code, the extension is trying to talk to it and it's not working. And that's because it just doesn't know how to do anything yet. Um, so we'll do, oh, actually let's leave this running. So I'm just going to uh, go back to our original rather than closing it because that way we can just hit this button up here when we want to restart it. We'll close the sidebar and we need to figure out how to make these things talk to each other so before if we go to the extension ts again this is the code for vs code that launches the language server so here we can see how that works it basically uh, gets sets up the server module as server.js this is the um, js version of the typescript file that we're writing in um, and all of that compilation is set up as part of this MB mvp also uh, and then we have a transport kind here of IPC, which is interprocess communication for node. Um, so what's happening basically is in the default, we're talking to the server process over IPC. And that way the, the, that's the, the channel that all of our JSON RPC messages are going to and from the client and server for. Uh, we don't wanna actually use that in this case. We're going to use a different transport we're going to use uh, standard in, standard out. So we'll go ahead and change this here. And then I want to take a, we'll close this file. That's the only change we're going to make in the client. And then I want to take a brief detour to look at the uh, LSP docs. So let's do that now. All right, so language server protocol specification. We're going to hop down to miscellaneous and then implementation considerations. So if we scroll down just a little bit, we see Servers usually support different communication channels, for example, standard in, standard out, and pipes, etc. To ease the usage of servers in different clients, it's highly recommended that a server implementation supports the following command line arguments to pick the communication channels. So ideally, your language server uh, has a command line argument to opt into one of these protocols. You don't have to support them all, but ideally, you let the client pick. Because we're just building this from scratch and we don't want to overcomplicate things with the communication channels, we're just going to do standard in, standard out. The other nice thing about standard in, standard out is that it's easy to get running with NeoVim and other clients. So we'll be using just standard in, standard out and ignoring the others. So the question then becomes, how do you speak uh, standard in, standard out in Node? How do we do this in our TypeScript? And the answer is actually to use process.standardin.onData. As we can see here, we wanna pass in a callback. We'll name the variable chunk and we'll learn more about why in a bit. And so in here is where we could actually act on data coming in over standard in. Because we're talking over standard in and standard out, we could actually write using a console.log. You'll see in the uh, explanation here that this prints to standard out with a new line. However, you're probably used to using console.log for debugging and uh, communicating directly to a user. So we're going to actually use process.standardout.write. Uh, I find that this is just a clearer name just to keep in my head. I don't have to confuse it with uh, you know, logging. It's not logging, it's writing. 
um, we're speaking to the client. So you may be asking yourself, well, if we can't console.log, how are we going to have debugging information? Don't worry, we'll get to that right now. So since we're reading over standard in and we're writing over standard out, we can't use console.log, we need another approach. So we're going to make a new file and we're gonna save it as source uh, log.ts. And then in here, we will import star as fs from fs. We'll set up a log, which is fs.createWriteStream. We'll write that to tmp lsp.log. So by creating a write stream at the start of our app booting, this will make sure that the log content is empty when the app starts. We're going to append to it as the app goes, and then we'll shut it down when the app ends. Um, and so what we'll do is we will say export default, and we're going to have a write function here. Write is going to take a message, which is either an object or unknown. If the type of message is object, we will uh, log.write json.stringify our message. Makes it a little more easy to read and also it won't crash the log. Uh, and then otherwise, we'll just log.write our message. And then for readability, we'll also do a new line after all of that. With that in place, we can import log from log. And now we will log out our chunk, log.write chunk. Okay, let's give this a spin and see if it works. So our file opened up over here and uh, we, we relaunched our extension host. So now we wanna do command O and open tmp lsp.log. Okay, so we have a buffer. That's not super great. Um, hmm, would have been nicer to get something useful here. So let's actually log out to string. We may want to rethink our logging approach later. Maybe we need a to string and then JSON parse things, but uh, we'll think a little more about that. Let's restart. And now looking at the log, we have a JSON RPC message. Excellent. So it has a content length of 5,752, uh, it's JSON RPC 2.0, which all messages in the LSP spec will be. Um, and then we have ID of zero, this is the first message being sent, and then a method of initialize. So the client is saying, hey server, uh, invoke the initialize function and give me the result. And we know that it wants the result because it's passing an ID. There's two types of messages in the language server protocol. There are, sorry, let's look at the base protocol. There are request messages, which need a response. Every process request must send back a response to the sender of the request. And those have an ID, a method, and params. We just saw all of those things. And then we have to send back a response message. There's also a notification message, which is the same as a request message, but it doesn't have an ID. So those are just like, hey, this thing happened. Don't need a reply from you, but this thing happened. You may wanna act on this thing that happened, but you don't need to reply. So we have a request message and we have, it has ID, method, params. Everything's also gonna have this JSON RPC prefix. Um, so let's go ahead and just copy this so that we have a type and we'll throw this over in our server. The nice thing about the language server spec is that you can copy a lot of things. You're gonna probably end up deleting a lot of comments because uh, while they're very helpful in the, the protocol doc itself, they're not going to be terribly helpful uh, in your code. So we can mostly copy things and delete comments, but occasionally you do need to, um, actually we'll make this an unknown. Occasionally you do need to change some types just because the, uh, integer over here is not something that exists in TypeScript and neither is just the plain array. Um, if we click on integer, we can see that it's actually just a number. We could declare that type first and then use it in our types, but we're not gonna go that far. 
Uh, and then we also want to define message since we're extending message. So we'll paste that up here. Perfect. Okay, we'll use these later, I swear. We're getting this request to fire the initialize method. We have some params. The params are basically telling us about the client. What's the client's name? What's its version? Uh, what sort of scenario is it running in? And then the interesting part is the capability. So this tells us what the client can do. And you can use this on your server to do a little bit of negotiation about, well, can I offer these actions based on what they can and can't do? We're going to ignore that for now. Uh, and instead, we're just going to look at the spec and see what the initialized method is supposed to look like and what it will return. This is under lifecycle messages, initialize. The initialize request is sent as the first request from the client to the server. Until the server has responded to the initialize request with an initialized result, the client must not send any additional requests or notifications to the server. So what we have right now is we're starting up, the client's sending us this initialize request. We're not responding yet, we don't know how. So the client's just sitting there, not further talking to us. So let's go to uh, initialize result momentarily, but first, just to note, uh, the way that these docs are structured, you can see the request here, it tells you uh, what the method is and then what the params are, and so you can click into those and get the type. But we're going to go ahead and jump ahead to the initialize result. If I scroll up a little bit, you can see that this is defined as part of the response. All right, so initialize result describes the capabilities of the server. So the request tells us about the client, the result tells the client about the server. So we're going to copy this. And the language server protocol is all about methods. So we're, it's JSON RPC, we're invoking remote methods. So what we're gonna do is open the sidebar here and we're gonna make a new folder. This folder is gonna be called methods because we're going to keep adding more and more. We'll make a new file in here and we'll call it initialize.ts. And now we can paste in our type. Again, we'll clean up comments here. Okay, we don't really care about server capabilities yet, but we should at least know the shape of it. So server capabilities is an object. We can just give it a record for now. Excellent. And so we should export our method. So we'll define it as export const initialize. It's going to take in a message, which is a request message. Then it's going to return an initialize result. And this code is a little grumpy because we haven't defined either of those things, but that's okay. Over in server, we will export this and now we can safely import it over here. And that makes that part happy. So now we just need to make our response, our, our return value of this initialize method conform with initialize result. And so to do that, we'll just return uh, an object with capabilities of an empty object for now. Some server info, we'll give ourselves a name and we'll give ourselves a version of 0.0.1. Over in our server, we can now import this method. And it feels like we're ready to respond, except when we think about what we're reading, we're not just getting the JSON payload here. We're getting our content length, we're getting the carriage returning a new line that happens after that, and then the one that happens after that, and then our JSON message. So. To be able to invoke initialize with a true request message, we need to parse out all of this other stuff first over in server.ts. We'll do that now. You might naively want to just split the chunk based on the new line characters. And then this would be position zero, this would be position one, and this would be position two. The problem is, as the name chunk implies here, we don't know that we have a single message that we're working with at a time. We could have part of a message. We could have the end of one message and the beginning of another message. We could have several tiny messages. Uh, it's just 
not something we can know ahead of time. So we can't just naively split and then parse JSON. Instead, we're going to have to accumulate the data in a buffer and then process our buffer. Don't worry, this sounds scarier than it is. So we'll let buffer equal an empty string. And then as things come in, we're going to buffer plus equals the chunk. So we're accumulating things. And if we just left it like this, this would just read and continue appending anything that we got to the buffer. That's great. So here's where we're gonna process things. We'll do a while true. We're gonna process every message that we can in this buffer, every message if any. So the first thing we're gonna do is check for the content length line. And we'll do that with a match. So we'll say length match is buffer.match content length colon. Then we're gonna have some number of digits and then the rn, carriage return new line. All right, so if we don't have a length match, then we're not ready to process anything yet. We don't have a full message, uh, so there's nothing we can do. If, if the content length header isn't there, there certainly isn't a message body. So we'll break, we'll continue accumulating and adding to our buffer. If we do have a length match though, we can extract the content length as a number. So this will be length match one. Uh, the zeroth place is the entire regex match. The one is our capture, the digits only, and we'll use base 10. And then we also know that the message actually starts um, after the carriage return new line, carriage return new line. So we'll say buffer.index of carriage return new line, carriage return new line, plus four to get past that content. So now we can check to see if we have an entire message because we know where it begins and how long it should be. So uh, we'll continue unless the full message is in the buffer. So we'll say if buffer.length is less than message start plus the content length, we'll break, we'll continue reading. Awesome. So if we've gotten this far, we know that we have the full message in the buffer and we know the size of that. So we can extract the message. We'll start off just getting the raw message. This will be the string content. Uh, this is buffer.slice, message start, and then the ending will be message start plus message, uh, sorry, plus content length. And then we can now parse this because we, we can feel confident that we have only the JSON object. So we'll say message is json.parse raw message. Oops, <laughs> raw message. And then we'll write something out to our log. So we'll do log.write. We'll give this uh, ID of message.id and uh, method of message.method. We won't care about the params for now. And so at this point, we could act on our message. So we'll do to do um, call method and respond. Uh, but we want to go ahead and finish up our loop here. So the last thing we're going to do is to remove the processed message from the buffer. This will prevent us from processing it again and again and let us just move on with things. So buffer is going to be buffer.slice message start plus content length. Okay, and so we should be able to start this and see the ID and the method for our initialized method being called. So we'll do that, we'll restart, pop back to the original window, and we do see that here. That's awesome. Now that we've isolated the JSON message, we can respond. So we could do this as if message.method equals initialize you know, respond, which we haven't implemented yet, with initialize message. But as you can imagine, as we add more and more methods, this is going to end up being a lot of else cases, or maybe we turn it into a case statement. I prefer to just go ahead and make a method lookup. So we'll get rid of that. And let's imagine what the method lookup uh, usage would actually look like. 
So we can say const method is going to be method lookup message.method. And then we can just say if method, we will in respond with the response, <laughs> respond with the results of our method being passed the message. And I think that's cleaner because then as we add new things, all we need to do is add them to the method lookup. And as long as they're request responses, this will work fine. Uh, to make this work, we do need to implement both method lookup and respond. So let's hop up to the top here. And down here, we will say const method lookup is going to be just initialize. It's the simplest thing that could work, but it actually needs to be a little more complicated than that because we're using an any to dig into that. So let's, let's just change this real quick. We're going to say it's a type of record string. So we're looking it up by the string name, the method name, and it's going to be a method. And then over here, we'll say that type method is going to be a function which takes a message of request message and then returns some object that we can serialize to JSON. So it's our initialized result for initialize, but it will be other things in other places. Um, since we named this method, but we're actually using request message, let's just go ahead and name this request method. And we'll do the same thing down here. It's a little clearer. Uh, so now we're down to one error, which is that we haven't implemented respond. Fortunately, we know how to talk over standard out, so this should be pretty straightforward. We'll say respond is a function. It's going to take an ID, which is a request message ID type. So it's gonna be a string or a number. And then it also is gonna take some result, which is an object. Uh, we need to turn this into a JSON RPC message, so we'll have to create that content length header. Um, to do the content length header, though, we first need to know the length of the message. And to know the length of the message, we need to convert it to JSON. So let's do that. Const message is going to be json.stringify ID and result. Uh, we can also check this against our response message over here. So it has an ID. Um, it has a result if it was successful. So in our respond here, we're assuming success, we'll handle errors differently. So result could actually be all of these things. Um, so let's, let's just change our type to actually be an unknown here. Uh, so we'll hop back over to our editor and we will change this to be an unknown. Perfect. Uh, so now we have our message. And as we know, we need to also have the content length header. So we can say header is going to be content length message length. We'll define that in a moment. And then rn, rn. So what is message length? Message length is going to be buffer.byte length of our message with UTF-8 encoding. So now we can uh, log.write our message, whoops, our header plus our message. And then we can process.standardout.write our header plus message. So now we should be working with a full loop here we need to correct one thing, which is we know that respond is going to need the message.id. Now that's happy. Um, so let's just talk about what we've done. We've built a buffer reader. We're reading on standard.in and accumulating our chunks into a buffer. Then we're processing any full messages that are in that buffer by checking for the content length header, breaking if we don't have it yet, keep reading. Otherwise, making sure we have the full message. If we don't have that, we keep reading. If we have everything though, we can parse out the raw message and then convert that to JSON. And then if we respond to the method, if we know about this method, we can invoke it and send out the response over our standard out. Then we remove the message from the buffer so that we can keep going. Um, respond is going to write a JSON RPC message out to the client. So maybe this just works. We'll hop over to our log and we'll restart. And we'll flip back and this looks really good guys 
uh, we have our initialized method being sent from the client. It's got ID of zero. We're replying with JSON RPC with a content length of 96. We send back our ID of zero so it knows, hey, this is the reply to that thing I sent. We specify empty capabilities, and then we specify our server info. And this is very cool. The client fires a notification that says that they're initialized. And we know this is a notification again because it doesn't have an ID. Uh, so this is super cool. We've built a functioning language server. It's able to boot up, uh, talk to a client, and initialize. Now, <laughs> it explicitly doesn't do anything yet because we haven't taught it how to, but this works and we can be proud of it. But of course we can't stop there, we just got going. Let's add in some capabilities. When I think about capabilities, uh, I think language features. So we'll hop down there. The first one I like to implement is always completion proposals. Completion proposals is the completion request. We know that since it's a request, that it is going to be sent to us with an ID and expects a response. You can also uh, see this in this emoji, which is kind of like a U-turn. So it's coming to us and then we're sending something back. Um, so this says the completion request is sent from the client to the server to compute completion items at a given cursor position. Completion items are presented in the IntelliSense user interface. So basically this gives you all the goodness of uh, code completion. So like the user types less than B and you know, aha, I'm in HTML, I can uh, suggest body. If we scroll down, we'll see that uh, there's a lot going on here. There's client capabilities. We're going to ignore those for now. Uh, there's server capabilities, which are specified by the completion provider property. And it can specify completion options. All of these are optional. So to enable this, we can actually just specify completion provider as a blank object. So let's, let's do that now. We'll hop over in our initialize and under capabilities, we'll throw this in. Um, and I can actually show you what this looks like immediately. So if we redo this, we'll hop over and look at our log. This is what we saw before, except we have the completion provider specified here. And of course our content length got a little higher. Uh, but check this out. Once we start typing, we get a text document completion request. We also get a cancel request. Uh, I believe this is because we didn't respond in a timely manner. So it just went ahead and canceled uh, that completion request. But uh, the important thing is that we have this method to respond to. Let's learn a little bit more about that in the spec. We'll scroll down. Okay, so the request comes with some completion params. We'll worry about those later. And the response sends a completion item array or a completion list or null. If completion item array is provided, it's interpreted to be complete. So it's the same as incomplete, is incomplete false and items. Okay, so it looks like completion list is our most flexible response type. So let's see what this is. It has an is incomplete field. Is incomplete indicates whether the list is or isn't complete. So if is incomplete is true, we're telling the client that it should keep sending us requests as it accumulates more characters that the user's typing because we might be able to provide better res results. If is incomplete is false, we're telling the client like, hey, what you've sent us so far that the user is typing is sufficient for us to give you exhaustive results and sending us more characters that they type isn't going to help. You should just do all the filtering in memory on your end. So we'll grab this. Item defaults is optional, we'll skip it for now. And then the last part is the completion items. So let's copy those. So we'll make a new folder and file for our method. So in methods, we'll make a new folder called text document and under text document we will make our completion.ts and in here we can paste in our interface so we'll do uh, the part where we delete the things that we don't want and then delete a little more Perfect, so we need to define completion item next.
completion item is a lot of optional fields and only one required field, which is label. Label is a string. So this is the label that shows up while the user's typing as the suggestion. And then assuming you don't provide any of these other options, it's also the text that gets inserted when they select that suggestion. So we'll just paste that in here. And now we can define our function. So we're going to export const completion. It's going to take a message that is type request message. And it's going to re reply with a completion list. Oops, completion list. We'll hard code a response here for now. And it will be is incomplete false. And we'll have some items. We'll do a label of type script, label of LSP, and then lab label of uh, Lua, just so we have another L in there. Okay, we don't know what request message is, so let's import that. And then back in our server, we can wire this up. So the same way we imported initialize, we will import completion. And then down here, we can't just throw completion in here because it's not the full method name. The full method name is text document completion. So we'll copy that and paste it over here and that's completion. Awesome. Uh, let's give this a try. So now we will reload and we'll type hello. We don't see anything because none of our examples start with an H. If we type L, we get the suggestion of LSP and Lua. We can you know, choose between those and then select one. And then TY gives us TypeScript. We also just get that for T. This works, awesome. Of course, having a static list of items is not super exciting, especially when it's only three things. So let's make this a little more exciting. We will get rid of all those examples and we're going to define items. So for items, what I want to do is use the system dictionary. So if you aren't aware of this, on Mac OS and most Unixy systems, there is a dictionary file. So I'll do Command O. And on Mac OS, it actually is uh, user share dict words. It's here in my history, so I can pick that. User share dict words. We'll hit enter. And we see that it's an alias. It's actually an alias to Web2. So when we open this up, it'll say Web2 at the top. But this is a list of a whole bunch of words. And there's actually almost 20, uh, almost 236,000 of them. So this will give us a lot of things to complete. Uh, so over here, we will import star as fs from fs. And then we'll say words is going to be fs.readfilesync. And then we'll, we'll give it that path. And then we want to split this on new lines, but uh, this is actually a buffer, so we should two string it first. And then we can split it. All right, then we can say that items is going to be words.map word and return a completion item representation of the word, which is label word. All right, that seems reasonable. So let's close this and give that a try. All right, so now we're gonna type A. And after a moment, we see a lot of suggestions. If we scroll this down, it goes a long way. Um, but this is great. So we can do AAR and get aardvark. Uh, we can do ZY and get all of these words that you probably don't recognize. I certainly don't. So that's great. But we do notice that when we press A, there's a good bit of a delay before things show up. Why is that? Take a moment to guess. If we look at our log, we'll find out why. This takes a moment to load. This is loading and I'm waiting. And then eventually it pops in and we see that the content length of our completion response is 5,325,660 bytes. And that's because on every response, we're sending every word in this dictionary represented as JSON. So we're sending megabytes of response. That's not ideal. Ideally, what we would do is we would see that the user had typed 
AA and only send things that start with AA. And if they had only typed A, we wouldn't send every word in the dictionary. We would just send you know, some reasonable number of it. But the question is, if the user has typed hello there and then types MA, how do we know that the thing that we're supposed to complete is just the MA part? And this gets even more tricky if you imagine that you know there's a ton of lines in this file. So there's stuff up here, stuff up here. And then on line two here, uh, they start typing MA and we should give them the results for MA. So how do we get this context of where they are and what they're typing? Now it's time to look at our completion params. So we ignored these before, but we'll, we'll come back and take a look at them in force. We'll scroll back up a little bit. Completion params. Okay, so completion params extend text document position params, work done progress params, and partial result params. They also optionally have a context of completion context. Now, since this is optional, we already know we can't rely on it, but let's just see what it is. Okay, completion context is a trigger kind, which is just invoked trigger character or trigger for incomplete completions. That's not helpful for giving us context. And then it could also have a trigger character, but this says that it's a single character, so that definitely could not help in our MA example. So we can rule out the completion context. We can look at partial results params. This is just about handling partial results when you're doing streaming. And since they're about the results and not the requests, that doesn't really help us. We have work done progress commands, which the server can use to report progress. That doesn't help either. So all we really have to work with is text document position params. Let's take a look at that. Text document position params has a representation of the text document, which is a text document identifier. That is a URI, which is just a string that represents the file path. So that'll give us the file's path on disk, but if the user hasn't saved the file, then we definitely can't read the content out of that file. So that's not gonna get us where we need to go by itself. We also have the position. This tells us where we are in the document. It has a line and a character. It sure looks like we don't have enough information to figure out what the user is typing currently. Uh, we, we can know where they're typing, what file they're in, and what position they're at, thanks to these text document position params, but we don't know what they're typing, and that's a problem. And this is where another part of the language server protocol comes into play, which is document synchronization. Document synchronization is the client's ability to send notifications to the server that a text document changed, opened, closed, etc. And so we can use this information to keep an in-memory representation of the documents the user is working with, and then combine that with our position to figure out where they're at in the document. And from that, we can extract the word that's in progress. If that sounds confusing, don't worry. We'll break it down one part at a time. Uh, there's lots of good notifications here. We're gonna work with text document did change. Um, so did change text document notification comes across as text document did change and includes did change text document params. Let's take a look at those. So those include a versioned document identifier, but it also has the actual content changes. And the text document content change event we see is an event describing a change to the text document. If only a text is provided, it's considered to be the full content of the document. Okay, so it could be this, in which case there's like a range and it sort of represents the change that happened, or it could be this, which is the whole text of the document. We're gonna go uh, this route because that's just easier for us to handle in this example. So let's back up a little bit. Uh, in order for this to work, we need to see server capabilities. For server capabilities, we have a text document sync property. And then the property uh, type needs to be specified as one of these two things. So we have a text document sync kind, which is none of zero, full of one, or incremental of two. So we can just say full as one. Okay, so we'll add this to our initialize. We're going to copy that, 
hop over into initialize and after our completion provider, we'll add this and say that it's one. We want the full changes. And let's restart. And we'll do H-E-L-L-O and then look at our log. This is still gonna lag for the moment. Um, yep, still processing, okay. Now we can scroll to the bottom and we should see we're not responding to this or logging out the params, but we did get the notification, which is great. Um, so let's just temporarily change this to also log out the um, params. So we'll say params are message, message.params. Let's rerun this real quick. Every log, wait for it to refresh. Okay, scroll back down. All right, cool. So text document did change. It has a URI, which represents the text document. This is the file and disk, example.txt. And it has the content changes, which is the full content. That's exactly what we wanted. Hello, hello, great. And if we look in here, we can see that did change happened to I'm sorry, that's a setup. Did change happen a few times. Here we just have our initial H, H E. Here's where I typed H E L dot L as an accident. Uh, here I changed it to hell and then we're to hello. So awesome. So we can use this to construct an in memory representation of the documents the user's editing and then coordinate that with our completion params to find out what they're typing at the moment that we want to complete. To do that, we need to respond to this method. So let's get rid of that log line. Make this all be back on one line again. Perfect. So let's grab this. And we know in our server, we're going to want to add that in here. And it will be did change. Doesn't exist yet, we'll make it exist. We'll make a new file from completion. We'll save it as did change.ts. Um, that's in our methods text document folder. And so this is our first notification. So it's not going to have the same shape of response that our request messages did. So we'll get to these types in a moment. Let's go ahead and work on implementing this. We'll grab our interfaces, our types from over here. We'll back up. Okay. So we're in the did change. We're going to get the did change document params. Great. So we'll grab this. We'll do the delete and clean up dance. All right, what is versioned text document identifier? Let's figure that out. Version text document identifier is a version which is an integer, but it also extends text document identifier. Uh, we'll call this a number. And then we'll say, um, let's make this an interface just so we can clearly extends. Oops, grab that. Oh, come on. So uh, interface that is going to be document URI. And then we know that document URI is just a string. Okay, so now we need to handle this guy. So we'll back up a little bit to get to where he was specified. And again, we're going to be on this side of the union. So it's just going to be a text string. Excellent, so uh, now we can implement our function. So we'll export const did change. This is going to take a message that is a notification message. So over in our server, let's define that. Um, we'll say that export interface notification notification message extends message 
and has these things. And then this will just extend notification message. Um, perfect. So now over in our did change, we do notification message. We get our import. That's great. And this is not going to return anything. So we'll explicitly mark it as a void. Awesome. So in our server, we can now import this. Now that we've imported it, we can put it into practice. Uh, this is happy, but you'll actually notice that this type is wrong. We don't have a request method here. We have a notification method. And the reason that this works is because when we were typing the request method, we were lazy and we made it an unknown. So we're going to change that to an object and that starts to fail and it fails for the notification, which we expect because did change is a void. It fails for completion also because completion could be completion list, which is an object, or it could be null. We'll do return type, type of initialize union return type type of completion and so now we have something valuable here uh, this is is understandably upset because uh, did change does not satisfy this this is going to be get long as we add more things but we can always refactor our types later so now what we're going to do is type a notification method and it's going to take a message, which is a notification message, and it's going to return void. It never returns anything. So now this can be a request method or a notification method. And this looks happy, but uh, this is actually wrong too, because respond is not going to have a result for a notification method and we shouldn't respond to notification methods. So we'll say that this could actually be an object or null uh, because we could also intentionally write out a null. We have a null response that's valid. So void is not assignable to type object or null. So what we can say then is const result is going to be method message and so we can say if result is not undefined then we will respond and we'll respond with our result so now result could either be an initialized result a completion list or null and that's great uh, and then we'll only be responding then with an object or null because both of these are an object. Uh, so let's let's kick this and actually we'll do one more thing, which is um, let's just log here. Uh, log dot write message. Kick it. Hello. Takes a moment. Hmm. Okay, so here's what we have. So we need to use our params to get the URI that's going to be the index for our in memory uh, documents. And then we'll store the text. So let's make a documents file. We'll make it in the same level as server. So we'll say this is documents.ts. And we will say const documents is going to be a new map of type document URI. I'll have to move that over in a second and document body, which we'll define. Okay, so we've got some stuff in did change that probably belongs in our main document area. I think it's gonna be all of these things. We'll do that for now. Can always move things around later. 
um, and then we'll say type document body is also going to be a string. So what we end up here with here is a map, and this is going to be exported so we can use it throughout our language server uh, that lets us represent the, the pair of, for this document URI, this is the document body. Great. Over in did change, we want both of these things. So version text document identifier, text document content change event. So let's just export those real quick. And then over here, we will import documents, import all of those things, uh, which is great. And so when we get our did change event come in, we want to represent our params as message.params as did change document params. So we know what they are. We can narrow those down here with an as. Uh, and then we'll do documents.set params.textdocument.uri to params.contentchanges0. It's a, a single item array. Dot text. That looks good. Uh, so now as changes come through, we're going to store them in our document store. Over in completion, we can now consume this document store. And what we'll do here is we want to get our completion params. So effectively what we want to end up saying is const content is documents.get document URI we haven't parsed out yet. Um, so let's figure out how to get document URI from our completion params. We'll hop over here. Perfect, so we'll hop back down in our sidebar to our language features, then our completion proposals. And now we can actually we'll skip over this and get skip over that and get to our completion programs. So again, completion programs has a bunch of stuff we don't care about. What we really care about is that it extends this. So we're gonna copy that and we'll paste it into our editor. And then we need to define text document position params. It's gonna be this. on. You may have guessed by now that I don't normally use uh, VS Code as my primary driver, and sometimes I get a little hung up on some of the UI. Uh, so text document identifier is the document URI. We already defined this one. Let's take a quick look over in documents. We did. Okay, so we can grab text document identifier from there, except that it's not exported. So let's do that real quick. And then we need to define position, which is uh, straightforward. We'll grab that from back here. Position is simply a line and character. Change these to number and to number. Okay, so now what we can do is say const params is going to be message.params as completion params. And instead of document URI here, we can do params.textdocument.uri. And I don't really know what to do with this yet, so let's just do a log.write. And we'll write out content like that, just so we can see. And we'll also, actually we'll say completion content. Great, we just need to import log and we're off to the races. Import log from log. Log. Great. Uh, we'll kick it. We'll type hello. We'll hop back to our log. We'll wait a moment. 
We're almost done waiting, folks. Uh, we'll scroll back up. Actually, let's look for completion. Great. So completion H. Um, then, oh man, it's also in here, huh? Okay, eventually we get to completion hello though, which is great. So everything is working. We have all of our content being stored in our memory, our in-memory representation of the documents. We have our completion method able to access that content. So now what we need to do is to use the content and the position for our completion to extract what's currently being written. All right, so we'll say const line, we'll, we'll name this current line, is going to be content.split, and then we'll get the position. Dot, oh, sorry, frams.position.line. All right, this tells us that we've done something wrong here. So documents actually could not have this content in it. Uh, this will only happen in an extreme case where like something went wrong, but we should still handle it just to make our types happy. So if not content, we're just going to return null. We're, we're not going to do anything here. Um, null is not assignable to type completion list. That's true. Perfect. So now we can reliably work with our content and we can get the current line, which is great. Uh, so then what we want to do is to ignore all the content uh, before the current position's current word being typed. Uh, but to do that, let's do const line until cursor is going to be current line dot slice zero, and we will end at params dot position dot character. This will take us up into the character. So now we can say that const current word is going to be line until cursor dot replace. And we're going to replace everything until a non-word character. Then we'll capture whatever's after that. And we'll replace that with, I think the dollar sign one is what we want here. Let's test this out. So we'll do log.write and we'll do completion. And let's just dump these all out. Uh, current line, line until cursor and current word. Perfect. To make our log a little more readable, we're going to temporarily uh, disable writing to it from our respond. This will kill all of the uh, completion results being dumped to our log. We'll put this back though once we're in a more manageable place. So we'll do hello there puppy and then after there we'll do ma. Okay let's check this out. All right so for the last completion, we have a current line, which is there uh, with an M at the end. So we don't have our A yet. That's sort of interesting. Oh, actually, I know why that is. It's because we're saying is incomplete false. So we want to say true so that we keep getting additional completion requests. Let's try that again. Hello there, puppy. This should hopefully be better. Awesome, there MA. So the line until cursor is there MA, and the current word is MA. Let's do a little more testing. So if we type stuff after this, and then we come back and do A, we should hopefully still see MA as our, uh, so line until cursor is MA, current word is MA. There's actually probably an issue here though, which is if we're just completing the beginning of a word, do NA there. No, our current word is still in A. Great, awesome, wonderful, love it. I was a little worried that our regex wasn't gonna work there, but uh, it did, so <laughs> that's always a pleasant surprise, isn't it? Excellent, um, this is really great. So now what we have is the current word and we can do some filtering. So 
instead of items always being this, we're going to bring it down here and we're going to say the items is words.filter uh, word. And we will return word dot starts with current word. Current word's a little misleading. Um, let's rename this to be current prefix. Great. So now we're only returning words that start with that prefix. So now what we can do is restore this because we should always have a reasonable number of items except in the pathological case of when we have a single character. So we'll make one more change actually so that even that's okay. Over in our completion, we'll also do a slice here. So we'll limit this to the first thousand results and we can retest. So if I do A, the results come back immediately and that's great, but I can still uh, dig down deep into there because we're matching the prefix. So even though we're only returning the first thousand results, we see the prefix is working. MA, MZ, no, nothing there. MY, there we go. And then if we look at our log, we'll see that this is actually, uh, these are reasonably sized responses. So even in the pathological case, let's actually just uh, clear this out real quick. So even in the case of us typing the letter A, um, the most that we're sending across is uh, 22,000 bytes. That's still maybe a lot, but it's super fast compared to shipping across the whole 5 million plus bytes. Uh, and so this is cool. So we could use this to build things like uh, HTML completion. We could have a, we could filter so that if we have the less than symbol and then B, we know that we can complete it as body, um, those sorts of things. There's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with completion, but we're gonna stop here. I wanted to close out this video by giving a brief example of connecting to our language server from another client. Language servers are client agnostic, so we should be able to connect from any editor uh, that supports a language server protocol. I'll connect from NeoVim. So in NeoVim, we're going to open our after ft plugin text.lua file. This is a code that gets evaluated and run whenever a .txt file opens. So I'll paste in our config here to get our language server started. So NeoVim will start this when you open a text file or it will check to see if one's already running uh, when you open a new text file. Vim.lsp.start and then we give it some config. We pass in the name of LSP from scratch. Our command is npx ts node and then the full path to our server.ts file. We're using ts node just so we don't have to transpile things to JavaScript first. We can run the TypeScript directly. And then we tell it to use the normal uh, NeoVim language server capabilities. We're gonna save this and then we'll nvim tmp example.txt. And we can actually do LSP info here and see that we are attached to LSP from scratch. Awesome. So now if we start typing, we get our suggestions as we hoped. Excellent. We did it. Take a deep breath. <sighs> We're done. We built a fully functional language server and we have a stable core that we can build new functionality on. I'd like to continue this. It'd be cool to add hover support, code actions, those sorts of things. Maybe we could support CSV files. It'd be cool to do like some, uh, have some code actions for math in there, or maybe we support some kind of web framework. I don't know. There's a lot of directions to go in. Another thought I have is building out some TDD tools so that you can do black box testing on both this and other language servers. Anyway, if you're interested in this sort of thing, give me a like, hit the subscribe button, and let me know in the comments what you'd like to see. Until next time.